so a little bit of housework, housekeeping, housework and housekeeping. Uh, the first is that I do indeed have a few copies of uh, the, a newer edition than Elizabeth quoted. This is certainly more than you want to know about the fishes of the Pacific Coast. <laughs> Some of you have it. There's probably one of you who does not. And that one person can buy all six copies that are here. They're 20 bucks a piece. So there's that. The other bit of housekeeping is that I did want to talk about um, this um, invasive species of fish that may get into California waters. So I'll give you a little background about that. So the fish is the cobia, which uh, is related to almost nothing. I mean, it's kind of like, it's its own family. It's kind of like a jack, kind of. Gets to be about six feet long, about 140 pounds, and is native to the Caribbean, Atlantic, and the other side of the Pacific, in the Philippines and so forth, Indian Ocean. It's never been in the Eastern Pacific, anywhere from Chile to North America. There's, it's never lived here. So uh, a year ago, uh, first of all, it's, it's uh, sport fishermen like it a lot, commercial fishermen like it a lot, and it's easy to raise as an aquaculture species. And the Ecuadorian government last year, um, um, in response to a petition by, by some uh, fish farmers, said, sure, you can grow it in the Pacific, which is uh, like uh, doomed to some kind of tragedy just right there on, on the surface. And sure enough, so um, back in uh, April of last year, there were th three or four very large pens put in the water, net pens, with uh, close to 100,000 of these animals, they're all about this big. And in August, there was a breach in one of the pens and uh, tens of thousands of them escaped. So we now have tens of thousands, I mean, some of them were probably eaten, but. Um, so three months later, uh, one, one was, at least one was caught 600 miles north of the release site in Panama. So that's a 200 mile uh, a month uh, run. Uh, there's no reason uh, that it shouldn't, they shouldn't eventually wind up here. They can tolerate water down to the low 60s, for instance. And so there's no, there's no like blockage because of currents or anything between us and, and them. Uh, they may not show up soon, but it's, it's reasonable to assume that, that they'll show up. Um, somebody asked me like, well, what could happen? And, re and I will characterize it for you the same way. You could run from nothing you have a handful of fish that come up, for instance, every summer and fall when the water warms up, and then they retreat to Baja, California. And that's what happens with uh, blue sharks and with billfishes and dorado, yellowtail to a certain extent, they come up when it gets warm, and then they retreat. So you could have just a handful of fish come up. Or the other extreme, I, I said you could have like uh, a mini uh, zombie apocalypse where uh, you, know, you have all of these these fish coming up and, and eating our brains. Well, not eating our brains exactly, but eating all the local fauna. I said the only real difference where the simile uh, kind of falls apart is these are zombies that you would want to fillet and eat. So, so that's where it kind of falls apart. But I thought it was not too bad. Um, and it's probably closer to the, the former case where eventually we will get seasonally these fish come up and they will compete with the local uh, uh, predators and they will eat the, the local prey, but probably not to the point where people are going like, we have no more crabs left. The crabs are all gone. The cobia ate all the crabs. Um, but, but there will be some competition. This is, what's interesting is this is the first time on the Pacific coast, really, that we've had uh, an introduced species that, that's a major predator. There, there are all kinds of little gobies that have been um, introduced into California waters accidentally from J Japan and Korea. But you know the, they, they're like three inches long, and, and whatever effect they're having is, is not real obvious. So this is the first time we have a marine species that is going to probably march all the way from Chile to central California, ultimately. So that was, uh, that was the, the big hot news. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, reproduction in fish. Many of the fish are going to be the ones we have in California. A number of them are not, but the, the, the principles uh, remain the same. I was thinking about uh, uh, reproduction. Well, I think about reproduction a lot. I'm, I'm a guy. But um, uh, I, 
but I was thinking, and, and, and this, this next little snippet, I actually have permission from my daughter, who is 37 years old, to tell this story. So uh, because I was thinking about reproduction and then telling about, talking about reproduction with your kids and all that stuff. So my daughter, uh, Shoshana, who uh, did everything early, said things early, and it, as you know, people who are parents, by the time your kid's 18, it hardly matters if they started reading when they were three. It's not, you know, it's not like they're Einstein or anything, it's just that they're early. So my daughter asked the big questions of life when she was very young, and it was usually, I was doing a postdoc in LA, we were living in Santa Monica, I had to drive to Occidental College, I had to get on the freeway at 6.30 in the morning. She would ask the big questions when I was like shaving. So I remember the first one, I, she was like three, and I'm shaving, got to get out of here. And she went, do you believe in God? And she's like three years old. So I said, shave, 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 shave. I said, well, what do we mean by God? Do you mean like a guy in the clouds? And she said, just answer the question, she said. <laughs> so, so I said, well, I'm, I'm kind of like, it was funny, but it wasn't that funny. So, uh, <laughs> So I said, well, I'm kind of like Thomas Jefferson. I'm kind of like a deist. I believe in the interrelationships of all living things. And she said, you believe in God. And I said, and then she said, I don't believe in God. And I said, fine with me. I got to get out of here. I got to get on the freeway. So, uh, and she must have been very slightly over three. And then uh, when she was almost four, shave, 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 she comes in and she goes like, well, where are babies from anyway? And I said, I got to get on the freeway. Uh, for your nighttime book, we'll read a biology text all about it. So uh, uh, at the time, I, I remember this, this is true, we were reading the, the Red Cross first aid book for her bedtime book. And she'd go like, I want to see the third degree burns again. Oh, yeah, that's good. So, so we read, uh, it was Bob Wallace's, who was an uh, associate of mine at UCSB at the, at the time, it was his introductory biology text, kind of for like junior college level. And you know he had a whole section on, on reproduction in mammals. And uh, Shoshana got really good. I could go like, where are the eggs produced? And she'd point. I'm going like, this is kind of amazing. And then she lost interest. She wanted to go back to the third degree burn. So, so that, and, you know, like nothing. And then two or three months later, she came back from her nursery school. And she came in and she said to me, Stephen, that was her friend, still has his testicles. And I said, well, males usually just keep them their whole lives. They don't like fall off normally. And she said, yes, he has them right here. And I said, well, it's not that important now, Shoshana, but by the time you're like 12, you should know the difference between tonsils and testicles. And I remember she went, oh yeah, like that. So, <laughs> so we're gonna talk about reproduction in, in fishes. And, and the, the thing, Actually, I have another story, but I cannot tell you this one because <laughs> even though she gave me permission, I really can't. So um, that was unfair of me to say that. So uh, yes, it was. So I can do an interpretive dance to it. No, I can't. So um, the thing to remember about fish is that, or fishes. By the way, do you know the difference between fish and fishes? Naturalist core, stand up and tell me the difference in unison. Naturalist core. Natural. Singular and plural in a way. Ah, that's very good, very good, thank you. Yes, if you're talking about one species of fish, it's fish. If you're talking about two or more species, there are many species of fishes at Santa Cruz Island. So you use an ES when it's more than one species. So fishes, uh, uh, the, the group fishes, goes back a long way, obviously further back than any other vertebrate or semi-vertebrate. And because of that, and we're talking 400, 450 million years, you have wide disparity among the fishes. Much wider differences, not just in reproduction, but in, in biology and behavior and physiology than you have with any other group, with birds or with reptiles or amphibians or, or mammals or, or whatever. And um, it, it just basically turns out that any way you can think of that it's feasible to reproduce, some fish has thought of it and is doing it and, uh, and is, is doing things that you, know, you go like, really, seriously, how do they do that? So we're gonna talk about some of those really, seriously, how do they do that? So I just wanna kind of introduce you to kind of basic groups of fishes. So there's three 
broad groups of fishes. What is that? And e who said it? E who said hagfish? You're absolutely. I can't even see you. Where are you? Who said hagfish? Who, who said that? Who said that? Oh, that, did you say hagfish? Fabulous. That was excellent. Somebody down here said eel. You do? Well, maybe you should come up and you can chat it up then. That was well done. That was fabulous. You have an ego the size of Bolivia, don't you? <laughs> really, wait until real life smacks you a good one. So anyway, yes, uh, as the young gentleman said, that's a, a hagfish, um, which aren't even vertebrates. And yet they're called fish. In fact, there's a debate among fish biologists. And what it's come down to, and I'm not even kidding, it's like it's come down to, well, they're always put in a book about fishes, so I guess they're fishes, which is kind of a tautology, but there you, there you go. Uh, hagfish, uh, as I say, have no, um, they have, uh, they're not vertebrates, they're chordates, but not vertebrates. They have no uh, jaws. The, their mouth stays open the whole time. They spend their life uh, eating dead and dying things. They enter them and suck out their insides, kind of wear away their insides. Um, and they eat like polychaetes, like worms uh, and so forth. They also produce humongous amounts of, of mucus, m massive quantities. And I know you're saying to yourself, well, I can produce massive amounts of mucus too. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I don't care what kind of an infection you had, no way is your mucus better than a hagfish mucus because hagfish actually produce little, almost like spider web threads that run through them. So you can actually pick them. You can take a bucket of seawater and throw a hagfish in, and it's all agitated, and it produces huge amounts of mucus. And the, the mucus is almost solid. You can actually lift it up. I have, a, I think, the next photograph. So that's uh, hagfish mucus, right? So isn't that amazing stuff? So, um, so the question is, well, why do they make mu all that mucus? And it actually wasn't known until recently, oh, maybe 10 years ago, when apparently a couple of, of uh, Canadian biologists, probably after drinking a lot of Molson's, said to themselves, you know what would be fun? Why don't we take a 50-pound leg of a pig and anchor it to the bottom of the seafloor in 100 feet of water, and then we'll put a camera on a tripod, and we'll see what happens. And then you know, we'll leave. And what happens is the first fish that come in are hagfish, because they're scavengers. And they're eating and gnawing away. And then other fish come in, like ratfish and so forth. And what they saw was that the hagfish were producing mucus, and it actually clogged the gills of the competing ratfish. And the ratfish would, would kind of tumble away. You know, they were actually drowning, in essence. So it's a, it's a way of, um, it's a competitive mechanism, is, is what it is. Um, so and then you have so you have hagfishes and, and and lampreys. That's one group, and then you have all the cartilaginous fishes whose um, bones are not uh, ossified like ours with a, a, a lot of uh, uh, calcium. They're they're cartilaginous, and they have all kinds of other features that are limited to sharks, skates, and rays, and to a certain extent ratfishes, which are kind of allied to them. There aren't that many species. Can't remember offhand, 450, 500 species of cartilaginous fishes worldwide. They go back about to the same period as the uh, hagfishes and lampreys uh, 400 million years ago, something like that. And as you can imagine, they've taken uh, uh, disparate courses. And, and again, when if you look at their reproduction, it's, it's, quite, it's quite different than almost any other uh, group of fishes. And then you have bony fishes, and that's when we think of fishes, that's what people tend to think of. This is a, a giant sea bass, a uh, very nice, kind of an advanced uh, bony fish. There are primitive ones like herrings are, are quite primitive or sturgeons. These are uh, uh, much more evolved. Um, by the way, I, I have some uh, folks in my, in my lab who are looking at these spots that, um, that giant sea bass have, and it turns out the spot's pattern is unique to each individual. You can actually tell individual giant sea bass apart by looking at the pattern and the size and the shape of those spots. So, and they, they actually have a software program that will help them kind of automate that. 
And um, what, wh the reason that could be useful is you may, we may actually be able to count all of the adult giant sea bass in California without having to uh, uh, tag them all or anything like that. If we can get enough divers in the water shooting photographs of enough uniquely spotted giant sea bass, in theory, if they photographed every one of them, and, and we're not talking like 10,000 giant sea bass, maybe 500 or something like that, we could actually fairly accurately count all of them, which would be really a, a blessing because no one knows how many there are. And people, fishermen, some fishermen anyway, are starting to go like, well, there's probably a lot of giant sea bass. They're back. So can we catch them now? And um, we, we'd like to be able to answer the question, well, how many of them you know, are there really? So if we look at um, reproduction, reproduction kind of falls into broad categories. So the, the one, if you look at most of the bony fishes, the dorados and tunas and fishes like that, basses and so forth, those are oviparous fish. Oviparous fish means that females produce eggs. The eggs are generally shed into the water somehow or the other, and then males come around and fertilize the eggs. And there's, there's all kinds of variants on that theme, but that's basically the theme. So these are bumphead wrasses. Uh, we, we have wrasses here, like a sheephead is a wrasse, but we'll talk about sheephead in a while. Uh, this happens to be off Australia. Uh, this is a very kind of archetypal way of reproducing. So uh, particularly in the tropics, you have, um, in some cases, every day of the year, you will have males and female bumpheads that are kind of swirling around, and then a male and a female will shoot up toward the surface of the water and spew eggs and sperm together, and you kind of hope for the best. And um, that's it for that female. But it turns out that in many cases, uh, with wrasses and other fishes, the males can reproduce uh, 20 or 30 times a day. So they'll just keep doing that over and over again, day after day after day. And the reason they can do it and females can't is that it takes far more energy to produce eggs than it does to produce sperm. So females will, will um, produce eggs or emit eggs maybe uh, once a day for months at a time. Males will do 20 or 30 times uh, a day. So here's a bit of doggerel I put together about that. This is on male wrasses mating numerous times per day. A wrass once said in a daze, priapism is not just a craze, for if we can't mate, we'll self-stimulate and get warts on our pelvic fin rays. <laughs> I hope that was that young gentleman who knew it all back there. <laughs> so those are, what are those? Mola Molo. I'm not, I'm only asking him. I don't want anybody else to answer this. <laughs> that is indeed a Mola Mola. I kind of thought you'd say ocean sunfish, but you gave the correct uh, genus and species name. Thank you. Are you sure you don't want to sit like, we can find you a seat a little closer up. There's one. Yeah, you want to sit up here? Can you see better up here? Let's move a chair over here. Because I tell you, it's a shame to have a person who's interested not be able to see properly. Here you go. Do you want to sit with your dad? We, we'll pull up a chair for your dad, too. I know your dad doesn't know anything, but <laughs> he means well, anyway. So yes, that is a, a mola mola. Now, um, what's interesting about molas is they have the same kind of reproduction, that is oviparity. They, the molas uh, release eggs and sperm into the water. Uh, it's the uh, incredible quantity of eggs the female produces, millions and millions of eggs per year. And these animals can live decades. So the, the, the subtext of that is that the uh, mortality rate of the eggs or the fertilized eggs must be astronomical. Because if, if, you, you know, if you have to produce whatever, two or three or 500 million eggs over your life, only to reproduce yourself and, and a mate, that means that essentially all the other ones, all the ones uh, die. Um, you can find big ones off California. You, some of you have probably seen them. I mean, they get like this big, but they don't reproduce off California. They reproduce in, in the tropics or in, in warmer, uh, warmer waters. 
okay? What do you think? What do you think? You want to give me an idea what species that is? No. Oh, that was very close. I'll give you one more chance. Grunion? No, that's, we, grunion are coming up. Sardines were, were even closer. Um, th this is the Pacific herring. And, and we don't have it here, so uh, you know, you're off the hook, I think. Um, these are Pacific herring. So, so we're still dealing with oviparity, but now we're talking about a little more control over where the females put the eggs. In molas and in uh, wrasses, it's just up in the water, and then the fertilized eggs, if they're fertilized, they just drift away. Now we're, we're um, to the point where the females, uh, it's kind of a, a decision on their part, where are we going to put the eggs? So Pacific herring, which are occasional in Southern California, not rare, but occasional, but far more abundant once you get to about San Francisco. And then they become a keystone species once you get up into Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. Um, they lay eggs, the females lay eggs on substrate, on um, rocks, intertidal rocks, or kelp, or, or things like that in the near shore. So this is, uh, these are all eggs, all herring eggs, oh, wow. at low tide. Right? And, and so that's on a, a rocky shore. You can see all the gulls back there. The gulls probably have eaten so much, they're going like, I never want to see <laughs> a herring egg again. What I would give for a piece of toast. Right? <laughs> Why aren't we in Santa Barbara where I can get some toast? Um, so, uh, so obviously the predation is very high, but uh, in, in an area like this, in these coves, you'll actually get eggs on top of eggs on top of eggs on top of eggs. So again, the chances are, are fairly good that, that some survive. So the, the females come in en masse and uh, just lay eggs all over the place. And then the males will, uh, will produce sperm, emit sperm uh, as a group. So you actually get something that looks like that, right? So that's all sperm. It's all herring sperm. Um, so well, I, I was about to say, you, you, when I see this picture, it makes me proud to be an American because <laughs> communists can't do this kind of stuff. You know? So, um, of course, this is in Canada, but still, <laughs> it's the principle of the thing. So, um, this happens to be a cove in Canada, but if you go to Alaska, you'll, you'll see the same, same kind of thing. So, so that's oviparity in, um, in bony fishes and we've talked about some of the bony fishes. Oviparity also exists in the sharks and skates and, and rays. Um, but the difference is that sharks, skates, and rays, and, and um, ratfish, which are related, they all have internal fertilization. What we've ta been talking about is um, eggs are um, strewn into the environment one way or another, and, and sperm comes along and fertilizes the eggs. In the case of all the cartilaginous fishes, the sperm has to get into the female. And it, um, this is a blue shark. Um, this is the underside of a, shark, of a female shark. And all you see basically is a, um, essentially a cloacal opening or a vent. So somehow sperm has to get in there because the ovary and uterus are, are inside. And that's the underside uh, of a shark. And you see these, these two tubes, basically tubes. They're called claspers. And all male shark skates and rays have claspers. That's how you can tell uh, the gender of these animals apart without having to dissect them. They all have that. They're analogous to, to penis in, in the sense that they're both used for uh, transferring sperm from a male to female. But in this case, basically, um, it's kind of a folded over tunnel so that the sperm it's not completely enclosed, it's partially enclosed, and it travels down, uh, down a tube um, that's partially uh, enclosed. There's, there's the claspers on a skate. So, um, so what's that? White shark. White shark. White shark, yes. Thank you. Um, but it's not just a white shark. This is a female white shark. How do we know it's a female white shark? Well. First of all, there's no claspers, but there's all of this stuff here. That's all scar marks. So if you think about it, uh, when a male mates with a female shark, skate, or ray, 
he has to be in a position long enough in a medium where everything's kind of moving around to insert one of his claspers into the, into the female. And the way many of the pelagic sharks, mako sharks, tiger sharks, is that they're, the females are bitten by the uh, male. And uh, 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 substantially enough that it causes scarring and, um, and bleeding. And, and uh, it is held on long enough to, to mate. It turns out that there's been natural selection for thicker skin in females on their backs and, and the sides of their heads. So the amount of trauma, I mean, it, it's probably usually not fatal, but um, I've read about this in like in Savage Love, this kind of, uh, this kind of thing. So, about half of those things, I don't know if you guys read that sex column, half of them I go like, I, I can't finish reading this section. I'm going to do something else with my, my time. That's a white chart. How about this? What's this? Thank you, and thank you too, over there. Um, so so the, the, the whole issue of um, holding a female in place um, was only vaguely known in, in these animals. Uh, and it certainly wasn't known in ratfish, which are, as I say, allied to uh, the cartilaginous fish. We have ratfish out here. Uh, here they live in really in like 200 feet of water and deeper. The further north you go, the shallower they get, and you go to Puget Sound, places like that in the, uh, at night, they'll come into the intertidal. The water's cold enough and they're active at night. And uh, they'll creep right in and, and they like to eat uh, uh, hard-shelled things, crabs and shrimps and stuff. So um, this is a, a nice typical uh, ratfish. They're really beautiful animals. Um, this is a male, and males have this uh, little, um, well, it's a twanger danger, as we say. In, in biology, um, it's it's actually it's called an elysium. So it, it's a little stalk, and at the end of the stalk, there's a little ball, and the ball has little spines on it. And up until about 10 or 15 years ago, no one knew what the spines, the little uh, um, it's called an esca. It's an elysium with an esca on top. No one knew what this device was for, and there was theories. Well, the males beat each other over the heads with them, but that seemed kind of far fetched, to say the least. And then a diver off uh, British Columbia took these pictures. I'll show you one picture. So um, this is a female, and this is the male, and the male is holding the female's pectoral fin with his little elysium and esca. So that's what it's used for. It's used for holding the female in place while uh, they're copulating, which in, in ratfish uh, can take a very long time. And you, you'd think that once they get it down, they could speed it up, but apparently not. So here's something on claspers. A large shark from up near the Cape had a clasper that looked like a grape. Females with mere glances disdained his advances, saying, it's not just the size, but the shape. <laughs> I'm sure some of us in this room can relate to that. I've seen the glossies, so I know that for a fact. So among the sharks, uh, again, even though they all have oviparity, there's all kinds of, of differences. So here's a horn shark. You find them here at the Channel Islands. The further south you go, the warmer water you go, the more of them there are. By the time you get to Catalina, they're far more abundant than at Santa Cruz. Um, they have internal fertilization. They have oviparity. And they produce eggs. So the eggs are fertilized inside the female. And uh, they develop this corkscrew-shaped uh, shell which is then extruded out. It has a little embryo inside. And the corkscrew is usually kind of jammeramid under a rock or under inside of a holdfast. And I think the corkscrew pattern uh, prevents, helps prevent the egg from being dislodged in, in swells. And then uh, there's the swell shark, very common uh, in, in the channel. And their, um, their egg case, I, I bet m many of you have seen that. There's, there it is. There's an embryo inside. When the um, young one is, is ready to um, come out, they actually have a couple little teeth right here, the, the um, juveniles, and they actually bite their way through the shell. And those two little teeth, or however many there are, they, they shed those. They lose those after, uh, after they come out. 
This, uh, this is a sand tiger shark. We don't have this. This lives in the Caribbean. But this is the extreme opposite of what we've seen here, where eggs are, um, uh, fertilized eggs are emitted by the, the female. In this group of sharks, and this includes white sharks and uh, mako sharks and threshers and so forth, um, there's internal fertilization. The eggs are fertilized. Uh, and then they develop into young sharks. And then when the sharks are uh, ready to be released, they, they swim, essentially swim out the mother, and they're fully functional fish at that point. They can feed and everything. Uh, this animal in this species, that's taken all the way to the end possible. So um, there's a mating, or actually probably more than one mating, and a number of eggs are fertilized. The first egg fertilized obviously will be the embryo that's the most advanced. That embryo eats the other embryos. So only one, even though many eggs might be fertilized, only one young comes out. Actually, it's every two years it comes out. So that's like, uh, that's like real competition, man. It's in the dark, and somebody's biting your ass. I mean, seriously, this is. <laughs> It's like working for Goldman Sachs, right? It's like the same kind of thing there. Okay, J young gentleman. Salmon. Salmon. Thank you very much. Would you would you want to try to guess what species of salmon? Next door to the king. Close. That was a, a good guess. Yes. Very good. Coho salmon, indeed. That was stunning, stunning. So this is the uh, spawning colorations of a coho salmon. Uh, salmon, I don't like salmon particularly. I, I think they're like one-trick ponies. And uh, you know they do something, everybody gets all jacked up. And like uh, I, I like them in cans, is really. Like, my view is, if when you catch a fish, it can't hurt you, then like, it's like some kind of wussy fish. Right. So, uh, so what do salmon do? Well, I mean, their big trick is that they're born in fresh water, and then they go to the ocean for, depending on the species, one to five years. And then generally, they come back to the same piece of fresh water, even if they've swum all the way halfway to Japan. Right. So, that, I mean, that's cool. That's fine. Whatever. Um, uh, but, but their reproduction is kind of interesting. So these fish die after they reproduce. Steelhead trout, which are actually extremely closely related to these, they don't die. But salmon on the Pacific coast, not the Atlantic salmon, the Pacific salmon, they all die. So they go up um, to their natal stream, ones where they were born in. Uh, the female, uh, this is kind of stereotypic, but it's generally what happens. The female digs out a little pit in, in gravel. The male comes over. Female puts the eggs down. A male. Um, put sperm on them, and then they both kind of shove gravel on top of the eggs. And uh, within a short period of time, they both, they both die. And there's a, I mean, I, uh, there's a, a, a lot of literature about how important dead salmon bodies are to forests. I mean, it's a big deal. But I still think they're wussy fish. So one day, <laughs> one day, um, Rachel, you, guys, you know who Rachel is? He's an artist in Ketchikan. A lot of people have his t-shirt, Spawn Till You Die. There ain't no nookie but chinookie, you know, that kind of thing. So he calls me up. He's a friend of mine. He says, uh, we want you to come up to Catch Can, and where he lives, and give a, a talk about fishes. We have a monthly uh, uh, meeting where people give lectures. I'm going, great. And about a week before I go up there, the local newspaper calls me. And they want to know something about me. And I do my little riff about how much I hate salmon and like that, right? So then Ray picks me up at the airport in Catch Can, and he goes like, well, he managed to offend everyone in the, in the city. And he explained why. And I went, oh, yeah, huh. He said, no, really. You offended everyone in the whole city. I'm going like, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to apologize. I'm going like, how can I apologize to the whole city? He said, well, we have an NPR station. And I've booked you for 4.30. <laughs> so I walk in and, uh, to the studio. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I had four years of therapy. I can apologize to anybody about anything, right? So I did. I said, oh, you know, I know that salmon are very important in the Northwest, blah, blah, blah. 
So I apologize. But then I thought, yeah, but they're still wussy fish. So anyway. <laughs> so, um, so that's salmon. I mean, the, the, and the big deal about salmon is that there was selection, maybe, no one knows exactly, but maybe five, six million years ago, something like that, for salmon to die after they reproduce. That is advantageous to those species, and that trait uh, is perpetuated because it, it works. So, by golly, here's a poem. The salmon's a fish so benighted, for in getting its wish, it's short-sighted, it swims at full steam to its clear natal stream, then dies of a love too requited. Okay, here's your chance. Oh no, come on. Grunion, that's right. Grunion, because most smelt don't spawn on beaches. Some do, and that was a, a decent guess, but most smelt do not. So this is grunion. Grunion live here. They, they, actually, they actually have been found from central Baja California all the way to Tomales Bay. Uh, <clears throat> Did you? Did you eat them? You didn't find them. Oh yeah, that's my problem, man. Me and my wife, my wife and I have gone about three times and we're, we're too old to be there at 1 in the morning. And, and we don't smoke dope anymore. So it's like, <laughs> ain't nothing happening here. And we can go home and neck if it comes to that, you know. So why should we be cold and miserable looking for some mythical fish? So, so uh, grunion uh, are oviparous. Uh, and... Um, What's cool about them, and, and separates them from almost all the fishes in the world, but not quite all the fishes, is that they will spawn on, on beaches, mostly in Southern California, as a matter of fact. Um, so the deal is, <clears throat> they spawn primarily from May to August, really peaking in, in June and July. They spawn at night. By the way, the species that lives in the Gulf of California spawns in the daytime, interestingly. Um, and uh, they only spawn on the new moon, right around the new moon and right around the full moon, when the tides are highest and, and lowest. But highest is the key. So they, they come out right around the highest of the high tides. They go up as far as they can go, as the waves will carry them. The females go straight up in the air, dig a hole with their tail, and the males come over and spray the females with sperm. And as the eggs are being emitted, the sperm goes down the female's body and fertilizes the eggs. Um, successive waves, then the fish all tail it back, and successive waves cover the eggs with sand, and because it's like the peak of the high tides, the eggs are, remain covered for two weeks until either the next new moon or, or, or full moon, when the waves come back and the eggs feel a gentle agitation because some water is coming down, and that gentle agitation breaks the fertilized uh, larvae out of the egg, and the uh, larvae pop out of the sand and swim off. So here is uh, an example. Here's a female. The males, um, when they see a female uh, going like this, they come over and they spray sperm. Here's the sperm. They kind of cup themselves uh, around uh, females. So you can get grunion males to mate with a stick. <laughs> now, I know most of you are going like, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and some of you are thinking, well, after about four beers, why not? <laughs> so, so here's the deal. This was told me by Boyd Walker, who is the uh, fish biologist at UCLA for many years. And he, he actually did most of the studies on Grunion in the 50s. <clears throat> and I think around 19, must have been about 1978, I was a postdoc down in LA and I talked to him about Grunion and he said, oh yeah, you can get him to mate with a, with a three foot long piece of dowling. I'm going like, really? He said, yeah, you take it down there and there's all these Grunion and you put the stick in the sand and you wiggle it back and forth and the males just pile on and spray sperm on it. And, and which actually makes sense if you think about it. These animals are spawning on flat, sandy beaches in general. There's nothing vertical on this beach. So the males are queuing in on the only vertical thing, females, 
that are wiggling back and forth. And that's all they have to worry about is finding something vertical that's wiggling. And there's been whatever, millions of years of natural selection for males that that's what they do because it works. So if you take a stick, they're not used to seeing a stick, but they are used to seeing something that wiggles back and forth. And uh, what the hell is kind of their attitude. Oh, look, something on Grunion. Now, the Grunion may look innocente, and it may try to act importante, but it's really quite randy when it gets where it's sandy, and you catch it quite in en flagrante. <laughs> the good book says, don't spill your seed. That's against every good Grunion's creed. Quote, if we tried penetration, there'd be no, no next generation. To our natures, we just have to heed. I don't want anybody to write the superintendent of the parks complaining about this talk. I'm just telling you. We have your names and your fingerprints. So there you go. <clears throat> and that is? Thank you. And also, thank you, of course. Um, so this is the state marine fish. I hate Garibaldi. They, uh, <laughs> they're, just, they're just like gangsters. They're just nasty animals. I, w I once wrote this years ago when uh, some Republican was running on family values. Wh who was that? Bush? One of those, one of those sick people um, was, <laughs> and that's the reason they never invite me back. So, so anyway, he was running on family values. And uh, at the time, I, I was uh, working casually on sea otter uh, biology. And, and I wrote an essay about why male sea otters have no family values, right? And which is true, they don't. They're awful animals. They're horrible animals, fit only to make hats out of, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so I posted it on my my website at the university, and 70-year-old girls would write these tear-drenched, metaphorically speaking, emails about how a sea otter saved its life, her life. And, and I said, you know, it's kind of like a satire. When Swift wrote uh, that we should eat uh, Irish children, he didn't actually mean that, you know, it's another point being made. So anyway, so um, Garibaldi, I mean, the males are like awful. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously it works for them, but as a, a child of the 60s, uh, I don't approve of their behavior. So basically, <clears throat> uh, both males and females are territorial, but males are like hyper-territorial during spawning season, which is approximately late April through early July or, or mid-July. Uh, before that, the males will prepare a nest area and they will bite and pick up anything that is not red algae out of the nest area. Brown algae, green algae, a crab, whatever. And um, so that they only get red algae. And then um, when the females are, are ready to uh, produce eggs, they will come into a nest, and, and it, it, it better only have red algae, Jack. That's all I got to say. Um, <clears throat> they lay the eggs, and then the, the, fe the male actually kind of chases them away, fertilizes them, and then he, he guards them. Well, it turns out, people who have actually looked at this in more detail, it's not as simple as that. The male actually will eat some of those fertilized eggs. And the uh, longer he only has that one group of eggs, no other female comes in, the more eggs he eats. So you find that females will start queuing in on, on males that have different, clearly different groups of eggs in there because, and, and we're, it's not logical, but they realize that if there's different bunches of eggs, the chances of the male eating her eggs are reduced than if there's only one clump of eggs or no clump of eggs. So it's kind of selection for <clears throat> multiple uh, broods. So anyway, here is, uh, here is a red algae nest. My associate in graduate school, uh, Dick Bray, uh, this picture obviously was taken about 1972. He, uh, he put a rock in the nest to show what it would do. So there is, picks up a rock and it hauls it away. And it looks really pissed when it does. <laughs> Angry, angry. You put a rock in the nest. It's like the odd couple there. So what's that? You want to guess, young gentleman, what that is? Uh, 
Yeah, it looks like one. It looks like a Garibaldi with painted spots. We actually built a little model Garibaldi and we painted spots on it just to test what other fish would do. So this is a juvenile. Juveniles have blue spots. They'll have blue spots until they mature. And then they lose the blue spots. So if you had to guess, what is the function of the blue spots? Knowing that only juveniles have blue spots. Big hint, huge hint. Oh. Oh. Protection from the forces of evil, from predators. Why would uh, blue spots help you against predators? It looks like an eye. Because it, it's blue and the ocean is blue. Not bad, but probably not correct. And probably not an eye spot, though this is a larger uh, 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 spot. We're relatively sure that the reason they have blue spots is that it's a way of telling the adults who are crazy that <laughs> I'm just a kid. I'm perhaps your kid. And if you, if you start pecking at me, you're going to drive me off the reef, and an angel shark will eat me, and there'll be no next generation. OK, and the way we tested that out, I didn't do it, another guy did it, was he made models of, of uh, Garibaldi, uh, little ones, the size of juveniles, and he painted some with blue spots and some without blue spots. And the ones without blue spots just got hammered by the adults, and the ones with blue spots did not. So there you go. I hate you, Garibaldi. <laughs> this is, uh, first of all, this is just a fabulous photograph. I just like to show it randomly. This is uh, blacksmith, very abundant in the Channel Islands over rocks. This happens to be <clears throat> in, on an oil platform. Um, a lot of my research over the last 20 years has been looking at the role that oil platforms play as fish habitat. And so we have lots of surveys and, and um, these animals are very abundant. And they, they have uh, nests of little cherry red eggs that are actually kind of hidden away. It's hard to find the nest. So that's the same principle as Garibaldi, and they are related to Garibaldi. But in this case, they kind of tuck the eggs away. They're not sticking out. And because of that, they're, they're not as good a garter because, not because, that's horrible to say that. The effect of hiding the eggs means predation is less, and you don't have to be as good a garter, is, is the point. This is a, oh, this could be tough. What do you think? Nice guess. Not quite. Scorpion fish? Almost. A sculpin? Yes. And do you know what kind of sculpin? Typhoon? Typhoon, no, cabazon. Someone said that over there. You can sit next to him at his feet, though. <laughs> Don't occupy the same seat, Jack. So this is a cabazon. Cabazon is one of the largest of the sculpins, certainly the largest of the sculpins in Southern California. There are sculpins uh, in, in the Gulf of Alaska that get a lot bigger. But um, this is our, our, our large one, again, on an oil platform. And these are its eggs right there. Uh, cabazon eggs come in reds and oranges and blues, all kinds of colors. The males guard them until they hatch. Um, if you go up to British Columbia, the males will guard them in the inner tidal so that when the tide leaves and the, the male has to leave, the eggs are hanging there on a rock in the air and nobody is eating them. You have ravens walking around looking for crabs, and you've got mink, and you've got all these things. Nobody's eating those eggs. And the reason is the eggs are really, really toxic. They actually have a chemical, his name just escaped me, that is found in only one other thing, and it's an unrelated fish in Kamchatka. Obviously, they, they evolved that, that, um, that toxin separately over you know, millions of years. Um, how, how bad is this if you ingest it? Well, uh, Carl Hubbs, one of the great ichthyologists who was at Scripps, he wrote a paper in the early 50s about what happened when he and a friend fried some up and, and ate them, and, uh, which was just inherently a stupid thing. Now, why, <laughs> why was it stupid? Well, there's a, there's a kind of a rule of thumb in nature 
that if something is brightly colored, it's not because like Picasso invented it, right? It's like, <laughs> it's dangerous somehow or the other. So if you have eggs that are bright red, so like, uh, don't eat it. So, so he ate them, he fried them up. And the paper, and I swear to God, it was more or less like, so soon after we ate them, we threw up. <laughs> then we had diarrhea. <laughs> then we threw up again. And then we had diarrhea. Did I mention we threw up? We did. Followed by diarrhea. So, I mean, it was like, I mean, it didn't go on for weeks, obviously, but it went on for some number of hours. No one died, but it's, it's certainly uh, um, enough that it makes you kind of think. Now, what, now, interestingly, it's almost certainly true that a mink, which is a vertebrate and a mammal, probably has the same response that we do. But the question is, if a crab ate these, would it actually be toxic to the crab? And no one's actually tested out the range of animals that these eggs are toxic to. Oh, seahorse, sea right. This is the um, Pacific seahorse, the ones that's found off California. Um, so I, just as a side note, up until last year, seahorses were like really rare off California. Really rare. If someone saw one, everybody would freak out. Uh, there was a little tiny population in San Diego Bay. People, divers made pilgrimages to San Diego Bay to try to find the handful of seahorses that live there, the water was warm. Uh, and, and almost no place else were, were they found. Uh, last year, El Nino, there are seahorses everywhere. Um, I just, I'm emailing with a guy, Mike Kofer. He was diving around the Newport Pier. He saw eight of them on a dive, right? That was more than people would see, and I'm not kidding, in a decade before. And he's not the only one. People have seen them all the time off La Jolla. And I just got a report from Santa Barbara Island and one from, from um, Catalina. And then I got an email from a woman at Pismo Beach, one washed up on the beach at Pismo Beach. It's the first time one has been found in Central California in 150 years, something like that. Just the, the furthest north uh, they'd ever been found was San Francisco Bay. And I think it was caught in like 1870 or something like that. And it had never been seen again north of Santa Barbara. I mean, it's like amazing. So uh, seahorses um, and their allies, I think I have a picture of a pipefish. There's a pipefish, um, which is essentially a seahorse that's been pulled out. Um, <laughs> they reproduce. Again, they're, they're oviparous. But, but what we've been talking about is greater and greater parental investment in protecting the young. So what, what these animals do, the males actually have a pouch. And they keep the fertilized eggs in the pouch until the eggs hatch and the little um, seahorses or whatever swim away. So that's like, the um, we're getting pretty close to the extreme of how you can be oviparous and take care of your young. And there, there is an absolute relationship between how many eggs you produce and how much parental care you have. If you have no parental care, you're one of those people like a mola, holy moly, millions of eggs. If you are a heavy parental care person, you're producing in some sharks, you know, one every two years at, at the uh, extreme. There's another one. So this is a cardinal fish. Cardinal fish males hold the eggs, the fertilized eggs, in their mouths until they hatch. Makes chewing gum. Anyways, so this is, I actually, I'm going to read you something. This is a, what's called a splashing tetra. Splashing tetras live in um, Southeast Asia, where it's damp. And I took this from a site about splashing tetras, because I couldn't do it justice, so I thought I'd read you how they reproduce. These are little fish. They live in um, swamps, right? Freshwater ponds and the like. Uh, sea arnaldae is unique among fishes in that it lays its eggs out of water. Well, grunion do too, but they, they, these actually lay their eggs on leaves and, and uh, logs, just out in the air. 
The male displays to passing females beneath overhanging vegetation growing beside its native waters. And when a receptive female accepts the invitation to spawn, this is the part that blows my tiny mind, she positions herself directly alongside the male and the pair leaps out of the water together, attaching themselves by fin suction to the underside of a leaf. The pair, the pair then produces and fertilizes six to eight eggs before falling back into the water. This procedure is repeated until as many as 200 eggs are attached to the leaf. Once the egg mass is complete, the male positions himself among fine leaf vegetation, watches the egg mass, and intermittently emerges from the cover to splash the eggs with water, using his tail fin to keep the eggs moist. Once the eggs hatch, the fry fall into the water and swim for cover. So, I mean, I read that and I go like, how did that evolve? And I'm not saying, I am, I'm saying it, it evolved. Um, though half of you don't believe that, apparently, if polls are correct, and if I'm offending any of you, <laughs> what can I say? So, what is wrong with you people? So anyway, don't, don't start, just don't start. Don't start, be nice, play nice with these people. Okay, so, um, but you do wonder, how, how, how did that evolve? I mean, who were the first male and female pair to like work it out? Were there a bunch that were just asynchronous and, and they just wound up frustrated and angry? And finally, the ones that actually did it, that gene was passed on and then everybody was like the Olympics and everybody was like, holy moly. I just love that so very much. So, so that, that's what the, the um, fertilized eggs look like on the underside of a leaf. <clears throat> okay, what do you think? Absolutely, that was a rockfish. This is a yellow eye rockfish. Rockfishes are um, the group that I specialize in. I actually have a tattoo of a, of a rockfish on my arm. Um, and um, they have, we're, we're now getting away from uh, oviparity, and now we're in what's called viviparity. In viviparity, the female feeds the young in her uterus. We are viviparous, okay? The difference is, in our case, the female, through a, a tube, through a placenta, feeds the, feeds the embryo. Uh, fish don't have placentas, so they're aplacental viviparous, but the female still feeds the young. She has to feed the young. Now, in rockfishes, what happens is they have internal fertilization, the eggs are fertilized, and then the female actually produces little tiny bits of nutrient globby things, and the, and the larvae eat them. Okay, so that's viviparity. It's just a different kind of viviparity. So this happens to be a yellow eye rockfish, kind of the classic Northwest um, uh, species. There's 50 kinds off Southern California. We have a bazillion of them. This is a copper rockfish. We have coppers here. Um, so, so you have this internal fertilization. Uh, no one has, get this, no one has ever seen rockfish mate on the entire Pacific coast of the United States. And you think, all the divers who are in the water, how is that possible? Uh, in Japan, you can uh, like uh, tell a Japanese biologist, I'd like to go see rockfish mate. And he goes like, sure. Takes you out and you go like, oh look, rockfish mating. Uh, but not off here. So it's probably at night, and there's not a lot of divers at night. And um, they may go up in the water column to mate. No one knows, but they do mate. Um, they make sounds, and the sounds are probably species specific, so they can tell each other apart. But occasionally, you get hybrid fish. So occasionally, you must get one kind of one species mating with another. And where that happens the most is in Puget Sound, with three species of rockfish, and nobody knows why. But it's it's true. So the the usual species that that hybridize this is a copper. <clears throat> this is called a quillback. And then you get things like this, which if you do the genetics on them, they actually are hybrid. And, and why the same two species don't hybridize on the outer coast, but only in Puget Sound, nobody knows. So here's one on copper rockfish. There once was a fish from the Sound who figured out something profound. Sex with one's own is just fair, but it just can't compare with inner species fooling around. <laughs> So what we were talking about before is kind of primitive viviparity. 
where the female produces little nutrient globules and the larvae um, eat them. And then the larvae come out and they're, they're just little hapless little goobers, man. And so for weeks they just drift around and anybody can eat them. Um, in the sea perches, you have viviparity, but the fish come out fully formed and, and ready to function. So this is a um, rubber lip perch. We have rubber lips commonly off, off the islands and on the mainland. Um, they use the lips, by the way, for feeding. They splay the lips down on a rock, and it creates a seal, and then they suck up everything that's there, little amphipods and like crustaceans and little chunks of rock and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> and then, this is magical, they have this mouthful of stuff, and they blow out the inedible stuff out their gill openings, and then they swallow the stuff that are, are, is good to eat. And they do the, that without having a tongue. Fishes don't actually have tongues. They have nothing movable in their mouth. They have something that looks like a tongue, but it's actually a series of bones holding their gills in place. They can't wiggle it around like, like we do. So somehow, the animal is winnowing out the good stuff and blowing out the bad stuff without a, a, a functional tongue. So this is a shiner perch, also very abundant. Um, actually, if it wasn't for shiner perch, little kids would catch nothing if they went fishing. <laughs> so here's, here's a little baby being born. Uh, tail first, and you think like, wouldn't that hurt? Because it, it, it's erecting all of its spines as it comes out. You think, but OK, you know, it, it works. So what the heck? So Bob Warner, who just retired at UCSB as a professor, he, uh, he, um, he and his students looked at fish reproduction a lot. And they found that um, the reef perch and dwarf perch, which um, reef, no, reef, reef don't live here very much, but the dwarf ones do. And, and like a dwarf perch on steroids is like about eight inches long. So these are really small fish. The males, when they're born, are born fully mature. They can immediately try to mate with a female as soon as they come out, and which they do. They immediately, they come out, here I am, where are the broads? And, uh, and then uh, Ron Harlan, who is, he got his PhD, apparently just snorkeling and looking at these poor males, he said they, in they inevitably go for the largest female they can find, and inevitably she shines them off. And then they have to go find some smaller female. And I thought about it, I thought, well, what kind of a pickup line can you have if you're in like your mom's uterus? You just pop out, like, what's your sign? I mean, it'd be like pretty primitive uh, pickup lines there. So, okay, so, um, so that's kind of all of the standard kind of reproduction. But then we have, because fish are fish, we have all these kind of semi-unusual ways of reproducing. So this is a cleaner fish. Uh, and cleaner fishes are wrasses. We have several wrasses here. We have the rock wrasse, we have the sheephead, and the senorita. And many wrasses change sex. Uh, not all species, but most of them do. And they all start out life as soon as they mature as females. And if they live long enough, they will become males. So um, the first person who studied this was Ross Robertson, who is a biologist at the Smithsonian Lab in Panama. And back in the 60s, he is the first person who actually discovered this. So what he did was, he went down and he, he um, if you go to a coral head off Panama and many other places, you'll find that there's a whole school of little cleaner fish that are doing just this. They're picking uh, parasites and dead and dying tissue off fish. So <clears throat> you'll have eight or 10 or 15 of these cleaner fish uh, on a coral head. And he found that the biggest of the cleaner fish in a species always was a male. Always. And the rest were either females or juveniles. So then what Ross did, he took a net and he scooped the male up and he took it on land and put it in an aquarium. And he found that the largest female became a male. And it actually became a male in just a relatively few days. Started acting like a male very quickly and then um, actually was functionally a male, went from having uh, ovaries to testes in, in just a handful of days. So what was going on there was, um, and then he, he, then he watched what, well, what's going on, and he found that the male would peck at all the females. And so that, that pecking, that aggression, 
was keeping the females female. And as soon as that aggression disappeared, the largest female uh, started acting like a male. So then what Ross did, he took the original male and he put it back in the water with his old group. And the new male reverted back and became a female again. Right? So you can, you can actually have them go back and forth, back and forth, until they become nuns. It's really like a <laughs> marker. That's actually not true. I just, though if someone wanted to give me a grant, I could study that <laughs> just to make sure it wasn't true. So here's a sheep head. I should have asked you. Did you think that was a sheep head? Did you? You wouldn't lie to me, would you? Yeah, you would. So um, this is, he probably knew it was a sheep head. This is a juvenile sheep head, very distinctive. Um, reds to bright pinks sometimes, mostly reds and oranges. Big black spots, three big black spots. That white slash mark, very typical for the first year or so of a sheep head's life. Uh, during our El Ninos in the last year, and when we've had the big blob off the coast, uh, sheep have, re have recruited, uh, have reproduced very successfully. And the reefs are like covered in little juvenile uh, sheep heads. So that's the juvenile, and that's the male. Nice picture, huh? Yeah. A, a female, and then that's the male. So female or um, uh, sheep heads start out life as um, immature fish. And then when they get to be three years old, two years old, sometimes one year old, they become functional females. Then if they live long enough and circumstances warrant, they will become males. Um, but they're not like their relatives, the cleaner fish. Several things have to happen in their environment. Uh, first of all, they have to, um, the major thing is there can't be too many males in their environment. It's not like there's only one. Now you can have a reef with eight or ten big males and uh, you'll still get females changing over but it'll be slow. If you took all, most of those males out then a lot of females will, will change. Uh, on average if you have an unfished reef, which we don't anymore, um, th they'll start changing when they're seven or eight years old. But they may last, they may not change until they're 20 years old. Just, just depends. There's aggression between uh, males during uh, reproductive season. And then you have fish like this. This is the zebra goby found up here, along with its close uh, relative, the neon goby or blue barred goby or whatever it's called. Um, and I'm not even going to go into detail, but suffice it to say, these have more genders and semi-genders and changing genders than any other fish I know. There, there's just males, there's just females, there's males and partially females, females partially males, there's mini males, there's maxi males, there's mini females. It like, I don't even remember all the things, all packed into a fish that's about an inch long. So <clears throat> you can um, you know, go all the way to the extreme like that. There are very, very few species of fish that are literally simultaneous hermaphrodites, both sexes at the same time. The classic one, however, is rivulus. Rivulus is, uh, think of it as sort of like a little minnow that lives in the Caribbean, and it lives in tidal pools um, that become isolated from the ocean, sometimes for uh, weeks on end. And um, they are, they're functional uh, hermaphrodites. If you take a rivulus and put it in an aquarium with no other rivulus, uh, in a, a month or two, you will see a whole bunch of little baby rivulus swimming around. The female fertilized itself. Now, you could say, well, how do you know that the female didn't store sperm from a previous mating and was just carrying it around? Well, you can take one of those brand new fish that's just a juvenile and put it in an aquarium, grow it up, and eventually it will produce little ones too. So they are, but, but um, you know, they'll do it, but they don't really respect themselves. So, I mean, they don't like to, they don't like to do it very often. The most extreme case, and I don't even know the name of this, there's a minnow that, a true minnow, I think, that lives in Mexico where the entire species is made up only of females. There's no males at all. So then the question is, well, how do they reproduce? They reproduce with males from other species. So then you go like, well, 
aren't the offspring's hybrids? The answer is no. What happens is they mate, the sperm hits the egg and just hits it. It doesn't enter the egg. It, and it's the act of hitting it that triggers the, the egg to start um, uh, breaking up into cells, into reproducing the cells. So you only wind up with females. There's no male uh, genetic material at all. Wow. How does that? Well, there you go. So this is on fishes that change sex. There are fishes we scarcely dare mention with behavior that merits attention. At ages quite tender, they blithely change gender, disdaining the normal convention. Labroides, a ras quite compact, where polygamy in harems is fact. If the male succumbs, a female becomes the male in appearance and act. Some basses now fight for their rights after lifetimes of onerous slights. When all's said and done, they're both sexes in one power to oppressed hermaphrodites. These sexes go others one more to us when sex is a bore. It may not be great, but if we can't find a date on ourselves, we surely can score. These are all you fathers and mothers, the rasses and basses and others. If we followed their lead, henceforth then our creed, all humans are sisters and brothers. Uh, always some political subtext, Milton. Always some political subtext. So uh, this is, uh, someone's not quite awake. I'll let you pass, it's late. So uh, for the rest of us, what is this? What are these? An enemy fish. Anemone fish. Anemone fish have uh, multiple interesting traits. The first thing is they are always found with anemones. Anemones have stinging cells. Uh, if other fish brushed against them, they would die. Anemone fish uh, don't die. In fact, you find them literally nestled in the stinging tentacles of, um, of anemones. Uh, these fishes, the, gr the group anemone fishes, are found in the tropics. They're not found uh, up our way. In fact, I don't even think we have anemone fishes anywhere uh, I, I don't think there are any in, even in Mexico. I'm not even sure there's any in the Eastern Pacific, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway, what's interesting about these is that if you go to wherever, Indonesia, which is probably the heartland of, of an enemy species, anyway, and you go to an enemy, you'll see generally three or four of a, of a species. Usually, different species will be on different species of anemones. And um, the largest one is a female. The next one is a mature male, and the other ones are immature. And just like in cleaning fish, if you remove the female, the male will become a female, and then the largest immature one becomes a male. So, um, so that's similar to what we've heard about, but, but where this ties into our popular culture is in the movie Finding Nemo, right? So you remember Finding Nemo? Nemo was an anemone fish, right? Has a mom and a dad. And what happens? to his mom. I know you were all devastated <laughs> and don't want to remember it's some kind of amnesia brought on by stress. The mom died, right? Now I was watching this and, and up until uh, the mom dies, I'm going like, wow, the writers really know a lot about tropical ecology. So what happens in the movie is that Nemo's mom dies and then Nemo is Shanghai and his dad finds him one way or another. But what would happen if the movie was real? His dad would become his mom, right? And I thought, now that's a movie. <laughs> I'd like, you know, if you have a bunch of kids seeing that, they'd be throwing up. It would be great. <laughs> Fine. Disney's office would be firebombed. It would be great. We all have a good time. <laughs> Fabulous. So here's an enemy fish. Gives my brain a contusion. I'm hoping this is an illusion, because you know it's a bother when your dad's now your mother. It's really a source of confusion. Ah. Ah. So now we are into the X-rated part of the show. I want you all to pretend you're adults. Kind of a stretch, but do the best you can. Pretend you're biologists. Pretend you're biologists. So um, this is the sperm drinking catfish. So this is a little tropical freshwater catfish. And what happens in the aptly named sperm drinking catfish 
is that when the females are ready to mate, they deposit eggs on the substrate, and then they eat them, and the eggs go through their body, out to near their vent, and they're not digested, and then a male comes over and sprays sperm into the female's mouth, and the sperm goes all the way down the digestive tract and fertilizes the eggs, and then they stay there until they, they hatch in some way. Down at the very end of the digestive tract, yes. So I know that it is fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> Tell me if you have interesting dreams tonight. <laughs> Sperm drinking by female catfish is a novel mode of insemination. That's the title of the paper where they discovered this. In matters we might call immoral, we come now to intercourse oral. For against all our wishes and happens and fishes, except, of course, when they quarrel. <laughs> Unless this behavior abates these fish fates, the bleakest of fates, from this kind of nookie, they should all play hooky, because it's illegal in six southern states. <laughs> well, clearly I should have pitched this talk lower instantly when I first started, now that I'm <laughs> focusing on this. Wow. So anybody know this one? Midshipman. Yes, you can take over for the sleeping gentleman over here. So you can take over the chair of power right there. So this is a midshipman. Midshipman, there are two species. We're going to mainly talk about Prichthys notatus. The, uh, I, actually, I just lost it. It's either the plain fin or the speckled fin. This is not the species we're talking about, but the principle uh, applies. Um, <clears throat> these animals live most of the year in three, four, five, six hundred feet of water. Uh, during the daytime, they bury themselves in the sand. I think I actually have a photograph. Yes. When you're going along in the sub, like we used to do when we had a sub, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's like a sandy bottom, muddy bottom usually, this is all you see. Two eyes and a little mouth sticking out of the mud. <clears throat> in the daytime, that's what they do. In the nighttime, they come out of the water, uh, out of the uh, seafloor, and they uh, hunt for plankton. They come up uh, many meters uh, above the bottom, and they hunt for euphausids and, and other crustaceans. Then, in about April, uh, the males come in shore first, and they prepare areas for spawning. And the areas are um, crevices, holes that they dig out under rocks. And, and we're talking like all the way from the inner tidal out to maybe 40 feet of water. Uh, they dig holes out under rocks or kelp holdfasts or pilings or whatever they can find. And then they sit there and they hum. They actually have, uh, they stridulate. They have muscles attached to their swim bladders and they vibrate them inside internally. And it makes this very loud, ha, like that, really loud. And uh, they'll just do it day after day after day. How loud is it? Well, um, one of the big spawning areas um, is in uh, Sausalito, in San Francisco Bay. And there are people who are living on their boats, and they can't sleep because all night long there's this humming sound. So um, I remember, who was it? Charles Gilbert, one of the first ichthyologists in California, uh, reported that he was walking along San Francisco Bay in about 1870. And he could hear them walking, all these males. He could hear them on land. Um, humming like that. So the, the female, and, and actually here, you can take a look at, there's someone holding one, that's the way they look. And this is actually in the inner tidal. Um, the eggs are now dry for a brief period, and the males will just stay right with them uh, as much as they can. They can actually breathe air for a short period of time. So um, they guard them. So a, a typical male, he's humming away, the female comes in, um, she lays eggs often on the upper side, the kind of the roof of this um, uh, crevice. And uh, he then uh, tells her to go away. And, and we assume that she goes offshore. She's um, shed all of her eggs. He will fertilize them. And then he guards them for however long it takes to, for them to mature. Sometimes there's more than one brood for more than one, one female. So that's the, the typical male. But then there's another kind of male. And uh, we'll tell you about them. So this is, and I'm not kidding. This is what is called the bourgeois male. That's the term, right? They're big. Um, 
uh, they hum, that's the bourgeois male, and they guard. This is called the sneaker male. Sneaker males cannot hum, and they don't guard, and their testes are four times the size of the bourgeois male. So what they do is they just kind of hang out, and the uh, bourgeois male hums, and the females come in, lays the eggs, and then the bourgeois male fertilizes the eggs, but at the same time, the sneaker male dives in and just sprays sperm everywhere, and just like hopes for the best, and then swims away until he can find another, uh, basically, nest of parasitized. So um, that's the sneaker males, and it turns out that salmon <clears throat> also have sneaker males, and these are males that don't get very big. They're often quite young. And the, the normal male will um, uh, help uh, fertilize the eggs and all that stuff. And the sneaker males will do the same thing. A little salmon will dive in and spray sperm and then uh, seek out another uh, exposed uh, uh, egg mass to, to, try to uh, try to fertilize. Midshipmen. The midshipmen's come hither their call, might hold all their ladies in thrall, but to those in their bunks, these are slimy skinned punks, and their harmonies soon start to pall. <laughs> this is the last one. You, you guys have been very brave. What did you think it was? Um, holy moly. You actually know all the fish on the Pacific Coast. How old are you? If you had to guess, how old do you think? Nine. Yeah, I, I, four? Did you say you're four? Yeah, four and a half. That half makes all the difference, doesn't it? Wow, way to go, my man, way to go, wow. This, this has only happened one other time. I was telling you about the time I went up to talk in Ketchikan for Ray Troll. It was a group of about 300. And I, it was, wasn't about sex, but it was you know, covering a lot of fish. And I, and I remember going, it was dark. And I remember saying, OK, what is this? And, and there's this little voice, white shark. And I'm going like, yeah, white shark, right, right. Talk about white shark. And something else. And, and this little voice is going like something. And I'm going like, yeah, who, what? And um, the gentleman was actually a bit older than our little savant here. And uh, uh, he, he was like six. And, and um, finally, I just said, just stand next to me and just tell them what, what they are. He was, it was amazing. So we have to learn more about your little friend there. He's quite remarkable. So this is the last. Um, there's two, two slides here. So this is an anglerfish. This is a deep water anglerfish. There are all kinds of anglerfish. <clears throat> Most people are, are familiar with the tropical ones which live in shallow water, sometimes very shallow water. They all have uh, um, a lure that comes out of their foreheads, and they can wave it around. The lure, at the end of it, it has things that look like um, little crustaceans or little worms. And obviously, that's used for luring prey in. Um, in the case of this species, which lives maybe a mile down, something like that, this is the lure here. And um, in it, it's dark down there, right? And it, it glows in the dark. There's actually bacteria that only live, the only place in the world they live, is in the lure of anglerfish. And it's bioluminescent. It glows blue in the dark. So it catches prey that way. And that's kind of cool. But here's the cool part. So this is the female, and, and that is the male right there. So um, these, I actually have a tattoo of this. So um, <laughs> one of the two tattoos. So, the way this works, we think, because no one's ever seen this, is that they start out life as separate animals. And the males have these huge pores, big nostrils. And we think what happens is as the female matures, she starts to lay down a pheromone, a chemical trail. And unattached males, who are juveniles, they pick up the scent, and they probably swim right up to the female, and they bite her right on the vent right there. And in some species, they never let go for the rest of their lives. And in fact, in one or two species, the female circulatory system busts into the male and takes the, the body over. And there's almost nothing left 
after a while, but a little sack of sperm. That's all that's left of the, of the male. So basically the male is a sexual parasite of, on the female. So it's interesting, the reason I got the tattoo of it is there's, if you have a big enough crowd, you reach some kind of critical mass, and you'll hear a gender difference in the response to that story, right? <laughs> You have females laughing and males going like, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> and I think it's because genders have experienced sexual parasitism differently. I think <laughs> females are going like, I had this boyfriend once, I had to hit him with a cleaver. He was just like after me all the time. And males are going like, this is great. <laughs> so I got a tattoo of that to remind me of the differences between males and females. Uh, then this last picture. So this is a female, and the poor male bit the female like between the eyes. And so that's, uh, that's going to be selected against, that kind of behavior, because uh, his sperm is not going to get any, it's just going to go into the poor lady's eyeball or something like that. <laughs> that ain't going to work, I think. So, so th that's it. I now know based on the responses, how I should have pitched it earlier, and now <laughs> I'm proud to have known you, actually. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so before all of you buy the six books I have, um, do we have like questions or thoughts? or? I just want to say very quickly, um, just a reminder, I'm going to come over to you. We probably only have time for about one or two questions. Um, and I probably should have prefaced the talk with the views that Dr. Love professes are the, his own. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, well, and I'll come over wait to you. Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> and we have well, questions. clearly, they're my own, but I think they represent <laughs> Most Americans, as far as I can tell. I, I'd be stunned, stunned if I didn't represent most Americans. We should ask my wife. She'll set me straight. Yeah. So this is about the cobia? Cobia, yes. Um, what is the average size of the cobia that have been found closer to Oh, here? so the deal was um, they were, when they escaped, they were about 45 centimeters, which is about this big. Um, and they mature when they're about... 50 centimeters. So they were just on the brink of being reproductive. And about two years old, something like that. Yeah. Way over in the corner there. Oh, way over in the corner there. So um, I was visiting my son in Istanbul, and we were drinking ouzo and talking about different things. And we were, the subject came up about octopus. And he yes, told me octopus. That one arm of the octopus is specifically for one thing. Are you going to tell me what that thing is? No. Or, <laughs> or do you want me. me to tell you because of some bizarre upbringing you had <laughs> in a cult in Indiana? So, yes, um, this is actually true for cephalopods in general that uh, in many species of cephalopods, squids, cuttlefish, uh, octopi, Octopuses. It turns out, parenthetically, that the plural of octopus is not octopi because it's not a Latin word. It's a Greek word. So I was put in my place. And um, um, so the, the um, male moves sperm from his body to the females using a, uh, a modified tentacle. Yes. So don't try that at home, sir. No. Okay. <laughs> Don't know where, I don't know where you were leading if this was kind of a practical question you were asking or I'm just, I'm here to not just give you information but to issue warnings to you if you want. And, and by the way, that comment does not represent the federal government because apparently you can use your hands or whatever. If, so, which is bizarre to me but that's what she says. So, yeah. Um, someone found a horse. Uh, seahorse at Bates Beach. About Where is Oklahoma. Bates Beach? Between here and Santa Barbara. So, do, you, do, do we know who that someone is? Yes. Can you, if yes. I give you a card, will you email me? Yes. Because yes. I'm 
collecting records. By the way, that applies to anybody. And actually, if you the guys Santa know. Barbara Wildlife Care Network um, hosted it, re uh, rescued it for a while, and had it in a. In a they pot. gave it like mouth to mouth. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> with a little teeny straw. Uh, Doctor Love, it. You with know, the no, no, only my wife calls me Doctor Love. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And only on those special <laughs> moments, uh, Milton. Milton. The Grunion, uh, are there? Grunion? I don't know you well uh, well enough to call me Doctor. Okay. <laughs> All yes, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the Grunion, are they on the beaches of Channel Islands? Do we have any record of them on yeah. or any other islands? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, certainly the some of the broader beaches on the backside of Santa Cruz, and Santa Rosa. I don't know Anacapa. I don't think it has a beach worthy of the name. So. And I don't know about San Miguel. The, once you get into that cold water, um, grunion reproduction uh, gets very low. I mean, um, grunion occasionally run around Morro Bay and Monterey, but it's actually quite rare. I think it's water temperature. Any other questions? Um, all we That's have it. time for tonight. Um, yes. but I, I want to remind you that I don't represent anybody <laughs> except myself. I don't even represent myself. That's where we are here. Dr. Love.